Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we come to your word today, we pray that you would feed us. We pray, Father, that you would incline our hearts to your testimonies, to your word, to your truth. Father, we do acknowledge that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone has the words of life. And so, Father, I pray that you give us ears to hear what he has to say today. I pray that the words would be received as they are, words indeed of spirit and life. And I pray that we would be transformed and um, that we'd be transformed more into the image of Christ today. So bless our time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When the gospel is proclaimed, it demands a response. The gospel, when it's proclaimed, it's not simply information that's being communicated, but there's a, a message. There's a, a message that demands that we say, what, what shall we do? Uh, we're to act based upon the message of the gospel. This is why when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, the crowd that heard him, they're cut to the heart, it says, and their response was, what shall we do? Or you think of Paul when he's preaching at Mars Hill in Acts 17. At the end of his sermon, he says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. The message of the gospel, it demands a response. And there's all kinds of different responses to the gospel. One response, a common response, is that people simply reject the message of the gospel. They, they, they reject the message of salvation. The message of good news, that seed is cast out, but it doesn't take root at all. The birds of the air, they come and they pluck it up, Jesus said, referring to the devil. The devil snatches up that seed. And the response of people is, that's ridiculous. That's foolish. I, I don't believe that at all. That's, not, that's one response. But another response is that the message is received and these people become disciples of Christ. But even within those that are disciples, there's a division, isn't there? There's a division within, within those that are disciples. The Bible, in general, in our passage in, in particular, makes it a, a di distinction between those that are false disciples of Christ and those that are true disciples of Christ. The false disciples may give appearance that they are truly saved, and they may give appearance for a long time. They are the rocky ground and the thorny ground. They spring up when they hear the word. They look alive, but there's no fruit from either of them. There's no fruit, and in time, they wither away. These false disciples are those who know about Christ, but they don't know Christ. These are people like Demas, who forsook the faith. He was a companion of Paul. He forsook the faith in love with this world. Or like Simon the Magician, who was baptized, but whose master was his own envy and his love of money. Or the greatest example is Judas Iscariot. Followed Jesus for three years. No one suspected that he was a false disciple. But then he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. So there are false disciples of Christ on one hand. On the other hand, there are true disciples of Christ. And these are men, women, and children who respond to the gospel in true faith. They have a living faith in Christ. They've been born again by the Spirit of God. They've been given the kingdom by Jesus Christ, and they have eternal life. So this should make us ask, if there's true disciples and there's false disciples, this should make us ask, how do we know 
those who are true disciples and those who are false disciples? Are there marks that we can know? Are there this, there, uh, things that tip them off as to who is someone that has a true faith in Christ and who does not have a true faith in Christ? Well, in our passage, Jesus has finished preaching to the crowd at the synagogue in Capernaum. And this message here is often called the bread of life discourse. And it's called that because Jesus had first fed the 5,000 with two fishes and five loaves of bread. The crowd followed him the next day, and Jesus declared to the crowd what the purpose of that sign was. And he said the purpose of the sign was not that he gave bread, but it's that he himself is bread. He's the bread of life come down from heaven. If anyone receives him by faith, they will have eternal life, Jesus says. Well, there's Jews, the Jews who came to hear him, who are not his disciples, they were offended at what he said. They grumbled, then they started disputing, and by the time we get to our passage, we don't read of these Jews who are not his disciples. They very well may have left at this point. In our passage, we have those who are disciples. So look at verse 60. Let me get to John 6 here. I'm in Luke. I'm not sure what I'm doing in Luke. John 6, in verse 6, he says, When many of his disciples heard it, they said. So these are disciples that are in view. These are people that have been following Jesus. They view Jesus as their rabbi, an authoritative teacher. They've been with him for some time. They followed him from place to place. They've seen his miracles. They'd say, Jesus is our master. We are his disciples. And yet in our passage, we see that there are of this group of disciples, we see there are those who are false disciples and there are those who are true disciples. There are those who respond to Christ's words, not as words of life, but then there are those who hear Christ's words and they say, you have the words of life. And this passage is a sobering warning and it's also a great encouragement for us. On one hand, it's a sobering warning because it should be a warning to all of us that any of us take heed lest in any of us there be an unbelieving, evil heart leading us to fall away from the living God. And on the other hand, it's encouraging because it shows us that true disciples, they see Christ. They know Christ. They know the goodness and the greatness and the glory of Jesus Christ. So today, let's look at two different sections. Let's look at the reaction of false disciples, and then we'll look at the reaction of true disciples. So first, the reaction of false disciples. Disciples, And we see four marks of a false disciple. You might say these are four symptoms of the disease of unbelief. You have any kind of a disease? There's a lot of talk of disease today. There's going to be symptoms that you have. These people have the disease of unbelief, and you see four distinct symptoms of unbelief in this passage. So here's the first one. They have a hard heart towards Jesus' words. A hard heart towards Jesus' words. Verse 60 says, When many of his disciples heard it, that is, heard his teaching, they said, This is a hard saying. Now, we mentioned last week that the word hard saying, it doesn't mean hard to understand. It means harsh or offensive. They viewed what Jesus was saying as harsh and offensive. It was, it was grating in their ears. But the problem wasn't that Jesus' words were hard. They weren't, they weren't harsh words but it was their hearts that were hard. The words that Jesus spoke were things like this. Jesus spoke of giving food that would endure to eternal life. In verse 27, he promised that if anyone comes to him, that he would never hunger. If anyone believes in him, he would never thirst. That our souls can be satisfied in Jesus. We see that in verse 35. He said that he is the true bread that comes down from heaven. That if anyone eats of him, that he will have eternal life, a bread that is far greater than the manna that was provided to their fathers in the wilderness. These are words of life here, aren't they? But they received it as offensive, harsh words. And so they say in verse 60, they say, who can listen to it? Now here we see their hard heart revealed a little bit more. They're not only saying, Jesus, your words are not words of life. They're offensive words. But now they start to slander him. They say, who could listen to this? Who in their right mind would listen to this? If anyone has listened to the words of Jesus and receives these as words of life, 
They're out of their mind. Who could listen to this? So now they're scoffing at Jesus. And then we see their hardest of heart by Jesus' response here in verse 61. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, let's just stop there for right now. How are they responding? How are they manifesting their hardness of heart? They're not responding by going to Jesus. They're grumbling. That's that word that we looked at a couple weeks ago. That means uh, a low murmur. So they're not saying they're, they're on belief. They're not saying it out loud. They're not going to Jesus and saying, these words are offensive. They're murmuring among themselves. And Jesus, he knows that they have this hardness of heart, not because he hears them, but again, look at verse 61. But Jesus, knowing in himself that they grumbled. Jesus knows their hearts. That's how he knew that they had this hardness of heart. So see what's happening here. They object to what Jesus says, but who are they not going to? They're not going to Jesus. They're not coming up to him and saying, Jesus, we don't understand what you're saying. These words seem offensive to us, but you're our master. Would you help us to understand? If they came with that kind of humility, Jesus would have said, he would have had patience with them. He has patience with his 12 disciples when they say, we don't understand this. Could you please help us understand it? But they're not doing that, are they? Instead, they're, they're staying back from Jesus and they're grumbling. These are offensive words. These are harsh words. These are not words of life. These are words of death. And their, their reaction here, it's typical of those who are false disciples. They didn't always have this attitude toward Jesus. They were following him. They, they, for a season of time, they loved to hear his words. They, they loved to be fed from Jesus, the benefits they got from Jesus. They, they were hoping that Jesus was a political savior for them. But when Jesus started to reveal to them who he really was, that he's, not, he's no mere man, he's the bread of life come from heaven, when he starts to expose their sin and says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, starting to reveal their hardness of heart, when he starts to speak of that they need to receive him by faith, they can't be holding him distant, they need to come to him by faith, then they start to back away from Jesus and say, that, that's not what we want. A false disciple does not follow Christ because of who Christ is. A false disciple follows Christ because of what they can receive from Jesus. But as soon as Jesus starts to reveal who he is and their own sin and the demands he makes upon them, a false disciple says, no thank you. So first we see is a hardness to Jesus' words. The second symptom here of unbelief is they judge Jesus in earthly terms. Jesus says in verse 61, he says, do you take offense at this? The Greek word there is skandalizo. That's where we get our word scandalize. Does this scandalize you? Does this cause you to trip up? And then he says in verse 62, he says, then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Now, it comes across a little bit in our English Bibles, but in the Greek, Jesus is, ask, is actually only asking half the question. He leaves the other part off. So what it literally says is, then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before, and that's it. The question is, well, then what? And it's implied. If you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before, what will you say for your unbelief? Is your unbelief going to be justified when you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Do you see what Jesus is saying here? One of the things that they had objected to was that Jesus is the bread of life come down from heaven. Jesus had claimed that he is of divine origin, that he is God. He's sent from God. And they said, how can he say this? We know his mother, we know his father, or so they thought. They're judging Jesus according to the flesh. They're thinking, well, of course he's not sent from God. No one is sent from God. No human being is sent from God. What is Jesus talking about? And Jesus is saying here, will that unbelief that you have towards me, is that unbelief going to stand up when you see me ascending into heaven? Well, we know from Scripture that after Jesus died, he was raised again on the third day. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven with the clouds. And the ascension proves that Jesus is God. It verifies that he is indeed the Son of God. Turn with me, if you would, to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 
8 and 9. Look at what it says here about the meaning of the ascension. Therefore, it says, Paul writes, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Notice what he says. In saying he ascended, what does that mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? The ascension proves the descension. The ascension, him going up to heaven, proves that Jesus was indeed sent from God. How could it not? He's ascending up on the clouds to go and sit at God's right hand. Well, he's no mere man then. He's sent from God. So Jesus is saying, you're judging me only according to earthly terms. You're thinking me as you think about anyone else. You don't see who I really am. And if you would see my ascension over a year from now, if you'd see my ascension, you would realize your unbelief is not justified. So that's the second mark of a false disciple. He judges Jesus according to the, to, uh, the flesh or to earthly terms. A third symptom of unbelief is they are devoid of the life-giving work of the Spirit. Look how Jesus describes the work of the Trinity in verses 63 to 65, back in John chapter 6. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all of them are at work here in giving spiritual life. If you have spiritual life today, if you know Jesus Christ, the entire Trinity has been at work to bring you to life. But these people here, they know nothing of the life-giving work of the Trinity. All right, John 6. John 6, look what he says in verse 63. It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The flesh, which is things that pertain to, uh, pertain to their natural selves. Uh, it can't produce life. Our flesh can't produce life. Jesus says it's the Spirit who gives life. Just as Adam, when Adam was made, he was formed by God out of the dust of the earth. But he wasn't a living being until God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Well, in a similar way, we, uh, we naturally don't have spiritual life. We don't have life to God. And it's not until God breathes into us by his Holy Spirit that we are born again, we're brought to newness of life, we're made alive to God. It's the Spirit who gives life. And these people here, they do not have the Spirit. So that's the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Look at the work of God, the Son. Verse 63, the end of it says, The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Now notice here the connection between the Holy Spirit and the words of Jesus. The Spirit gives life. Well, how does the Spirit give life? It's through the words of Jesus. Jesus says, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The way you can think of it is, the Spirit is the agent of new birth, the agent of new creation, and Jesus' words, the words of the gospel, are the means by which we're made spiritually alive. The Spirit works through the gospel to bring people to newness of life. The, the Spirit's not pointing us to anyone else. He's not pointing us to any other, any other person at all. He's not pointing us within ourselves. He's pointing us to the words of Christ. That's how we're made alive. So when the message of the gospel goes forth, what happens if someone is brought to newness of life, it's the Spirit who uses that seed of the gospel and he plants it within our hearts, and he causes us, he causes that to take root, and we're made alive. In 1 Peter 1, 23, Peter writes, but you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. So you can say you're born again by the Spirit, but you can also say you're born again by the word of God, because the word of God Focus in Jesus Christ, his words, his words are life. They give life. They produce life. The Spirit works through the words of Jesus. And then Jesus talks about the work of the, God, work of the Father. So in verse 64, he says, There are some of you who do not believe. And this some is most of them. And then he says in verse 65, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted to him by the Father. He's revealing to them their need of the life-giving work of the Father. Now, he's mentioned this before. He mentioned this in verse 44, if you look back there. There he writes, or there it says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. What I find interesting is, in verse 44 he says, unless the Father draws him. In verse 65 he says, unless the Father unless the Father, it's granted to him by the Father. 
And I think this, this shows us the loving nature of the Father's drawing of sinners. For the Father to draw people, it's not him being capricious. We shouldn't think of it that way. Uh, we shouldn't think, um, why does he draw that person and not others? It's not him being capricious. It's him being gracious. Unless the Father draws him, unless it's granted to him by the Father. Granted like a gift. It's a gift from the Father for him to draw people to himself, for him to bring people to himself and to the Son. That's a gift from the Father. It's a loving gift from the Father. So here we see the Trinity. The Spirit is the one who causes us to be born again. The means of the work of the Spirit is the life-giving works of Jesus. And the Father is the one who draws sinners to himself. And these people here are devoid of the life-giving work of the Trinity. The final mark here is they forsake Christ and the community of faith. Verse 66 says, After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. This is one of the very sad scenes in John. These people who are many, it says, perhaps hundreds of people who have followed Christ, they had seen so much, they had heard the words of life in Jesus Christ, And here they go back to their homes. They leave Jesus Christ, the source of life. They go back to their homes and forsake Christ. A telltale sign of a false disciple is one who leaves Christ and the people of Christ. In 1 John 2.19, listen to what John, the Apostle John, says in his letter. He says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. Notice, it's the community of faith there. They, they, they went out from us, the community of faith, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not of us. So John is talking about those who are, who are forsaking Christ and his people. They went out from us, it says. Well, how should we think of those who forsake Christ and the church? How should we think of those who forsake Jesus? Well, we should not think that they've lost their faith. We should think that their forsaking Christ reveals that they never had a genuine faith in the first place. Again, John says, they went out from us to reveal that they were not of us. They never were of us. And isn't that what we see in John 6 here? If you look at John 6 and verse 64, it says in the middle of it, for Jesus knew from the beginning those who who did not believe. These disciples here of Jesus, they weren't believers of Jesus. They didn't have a living faith in Jesus Christ. So when these perhaps hundreds of disciples are leaving Jesus, this isn't Jesus losing true disciples. This is false professors of the faith revealing that they don't have a living faith by forsaking Jesus. A telltale sign of one who does not have a true faith in Jesus Christ is He rejects Christ and rejects the people of God. And so we must ask ourselves, do we see these symptoms of unbelief in our heart? Do you have a hard heart to Jesus' words? Are there words that he says, like his claims to be the Son of God, his call for us to partake of him by faith? Maybe his calls to obedience about various things. Um, do they, do they grate on you? Do, do they cause you to get your back up? Do you say, I don't like those words? Do you judge him in earthly terms? Do you view him as a good teacher, worthy of reverence and honor, but not worship? Because he, he's just a man like us. It's impossible for him to be God made man. God become man. Are you empty of the life-giving work of the Trinity? The Spirit hasn't caused you to be born again. You don't receive the words of Christ, and you haven't been drawn by the Father. Have you forsaken Christ and the people of Christ? Well, friend, if the answer is yes to those questions, then you are a false disciple of Christ. That's what we we see in this passage here. And you need the saving grace that's found only in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So those are the symptoms of unbelief, the symptoms of a false disciple. But let's now look at what are the marks of a true disciple of Christ. What does a true disciple of Christ say about Jesus Christ? And we see three marks here in verses 67 through 71. Notice in verse 67, 
as these many false disciples leave Jesus, Jesus then turns to the 12 and he says, do you want to go away as well? That's an amazing question. But don't think that he's asking this in sadness. He's not saying, please don't leave me. You won't leave me, will you? We know that because Jesus knows their hearts. He knew the hearts of these false disciples. He knew that they didn't believe in him. He knows the hearts of these, of his 12, and he knows that all of them but one, Judas Iscariot, he knows their hearts. So in asking this question, he's actually drawing out their faith. What do you believe, 12? Will you leave me as well? So look at the three marks of a true disciple of Christ. First, it's a resolution to follow Jesus alone. A resolution to follow Jesus alone. Simon Peter speaks up on behalf of the twelve and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? In this short question, Peter, on behalf of the twelve, is revealing his allegiance to Jesus and Jesus alone. They don't view Jesus as one of many options. They don't see him as one of many competitors. They're not hedging their bets. They have someone else, a second master, that they're going to follow if things don't, fall, don't, don't go through with Jesus. No, they, they see the life that's in Christ and the absolute emptiness in anything else. Beloved, when, when Christ calls us, he calls us to follow him. In Luke 9, 62, Jesus says, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And my, one of my best friends back in Wisconsin, um, he was an older man, he had a, uh, a ministry called Hands to the Plow Ministry. I'm sure he still has this, this ministry. And it was based on that passage, Luke 9, 62. And the, the picture there is, if you put your hands to the plow, you're trying to uh, 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 dig a, a, a furrow. Uh, you can't be looking back. You can't be looking back at your family or your house, or you're going to be worthless for plowing. You're going to be all over the place. You have to look straight ahead. And Jesus says, if you follow after me, you have to put your hands to the plow. You can't look back. You have to have undivided devotion to me. A true faith says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Shall we go to the world? Well, the world is going to deceive us with all of its lies. Shall we go to our sin? Our sin's going to destroy us. Shall we go to political leaders? Is there a lot of truth in political leaders? Are they a trustworthy guide? <laughs> no, we can't go to political leaders. Shall we go to scientists? Are scientists a sure guide for what truth is? Scientists believe that we evolved from monkeys. I don't think that they're a sure guide. Shall we go to philosophers like Plato or Descartes or Hume? Well, they claim to be wise, but they're fools. Shall we go to Muhammad or Buddha? Is there life in Muhammad and Buddha? No, they're dead. There's no life in them. Shall we go to Moses or the prophets? If we go to them, they're going to point us back to you. Lord, to whom shall we go? That's what a believer says. And isn't that what you say? Where, where shall we go? There's, there's, there's no life in anyone else. There's no truth in anyone else. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. The second mark of a true faith is it feeds upon the words of Christ as life. Peter goes on to say, you have the words of eternal life. Well, Jesus has already stated in verse 63, my words are spirit and life. And now the 12 are saying, amen. We agree. You alone have the words of eternal life. The words that made the other disciples stumble, like, I'm the bread of life, come down from heaven. If anyone would come to me, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Those words that made them stumble, the 12 here, they say, these are words of life. These are words of life. These are words of eternal life, they say. And beloved, there's nothing more valuable than eternal life. Eternal life is not simply life without end. Eternal life is qualitatively the most superior life. Eternal life, Jesus says in John 17, is to know God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. It's to know him. Eternal life is to be born again through the Spirit of God, and to receive that Spirit to us as a pledge of our future inheritance. The Spirit's work within us right now, the way that he is pointing our hearts to Christ and filling our hearts with joy, that's a down payment of the joy and the peace and the blessing that we one day will have in glory. Eternal life is to be reconciled with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's to have our sins forgiven. 
It's to know God as your loving Father. Eternal life is to see the glory of Christ through the eyes of faith, to see him as good, as wonderful, and to trust in him. Eternal life is to have the assurance of a resurrection body, that when Christ comes back, the trumpet will sound, and in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we will receive a resurrection body. Whether we've been dead for hundreds or thousands of years, or whether we are still alive, we'll receive a resurrection body like Jesus' body, with no weakness, no sickness, no decay, and no fear of the coronavirus. On that day, we will be free from sin and battling sin and all the grief and burdens that we face because of our own sin. What a day that's going to be. We will be in the presence of Christ and his goodness and his love and mercy will so fill us that it would seem that our hearts will burst with joy. The radiance of the glory of Christ that we'll see in that day will be the most awesome and beautiful thing that you have ever seen in your entire life. And to be in a holy place before a holy God in the presence of the holy angels and we ourselves clothed in holiness because of the righteousness of Christ, that is going to be such a wonderful day. We're going to have so much joy. We'll be with the saints and we'll be forever shouting forth the praises of God for all eternity. That's what eternal life is. Well, where are we going to go to find the words of eternal life? Where are we going to go to find these words? It's only in Jesus. Jesus is the only one who has the words of eternal life. The words that point to this eternal life, but not only that, the words that produce eternal life within us. The Spirit working through the words of Jesus to produce life within us. So the second mark of a believer is we feast upon the words of Christ. If we're going to have eternal life, we need to feast upon these words. And if you're a believer today, that is what you do, isn't it? You feast upon the words of Christ. They are life to you. And the third belief, and I'll close with this, is it's an intimate belief that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God. Peter says, And we have believed and have come to know. The word know, we'll see this in John consistently speaks of a personal, intimate knowledge. We have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. The Holy One of God is a messianic title. It's a a title that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the anointed one. He's the son of David who's been promised, who is a king who will rule in righteousness. And all enemies will be placed under this son of David. He is the Holy One. And as the Holy One, he is without sin and therefore uniquely qualified to deal with the sin of the world. That he paid for it once and for all by his atoning death on the cross. And Peter saying that he has come and the disciples have come to know that he is the Holy One of God. They didn't just hear about this. They didn't experience it through someone else. They didn't read about it in the papers. They have come to know this. It has been revealed to them. The Father has drawn them. The Spirit has awakened them. They've tasted of the words of life. They know this. It's, It's not a knowledge of, you can think of it this way, it's not a knowledge of knowing intellectually that honey is sweet. You can read books about that and study about it here. All, all sorts of uh, people having testimony about how sweet honey is. It's so wonderful. Our kids love to have honey on their cereal in the morning. Well, we re- read the testimony of the Schumann kids. Honey is sweet. Well, that's not the knowledge that's being talked about here. It's not a theoretical knowledge. It's actually tasting the honey. You know it. We have come to believe and have known. We've known through revelation that you have given us, opening our eyes. We know that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Can you say that today? You know that Jesus is the Holy One of God? You've seen him with your eyes of faith. You've come to know him. You know that he is the Messiah. You know that he's the only one by whom you're going to be able to attain eternal life and glory in heaven. Do you know that today? Well, a true believer says, we have come to know this. Yes, there are days where we struggle with doubt. There's days that we deal with sin. And sometimes that knowledge seems, seems small. But we have come to know this. So brothers and sisters, do we not have a great Savior? Who can compare to Christ? What kindness and love that he has shown to us that we in our sin and in our deadness 
that the bread of life came down from heaven and has spoken life, that we might have life. God is so good. Let's pray. Father, we bless and praise and give glory to Christ. Father, we are so thankful for the salvation that we have in Jesus. Father, we can say, where, where else shall we go? Christ alone has the words of eternal life. Father, increase our vision of Christ, increase our love for Christ, increase our dependence upon Christ and his word. Father, may we feed regularly upon the words of Christ. And Father, I pray that if there's any that are here today, that they can't say with confidence, I have come to know that Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God. I, I can't say that. I, I haven't tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I don't know that yet. Father, I pray that they would talk to me, they talk to Roger, Chuck, Kevin, others in this church. Father, today is the day of salvation, your word says. Today is the day of salvation. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. And here's Jesus with his arms wide open saying, I'm the bread of life. If you come to me, you will never hunger. If you believe in me, you will never thirst. So Father, bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I pray. And it's in his name that we pray and ask. All God's people said, amen.